Good morning. Good morning. Oh, fantastic. Great. Um, this room is too big. I mean, it just makes it look like, you know, we've lost a lot of people. But hey, I'm so glad that you've come and thank you so much for coming to this session, which is really focusing about redirecting private sector finance in deforestation free, um, deforestation uh, free commodity production. We all know that forests obviously are responsible for sequestering carbon and really helping our planet get a little bit cooler and not get warmer, but also they purify water. Um, but not only do they do that, but they also conserve biodiversity. Now in 2011, interestingly, um, we had world leaders come together and make pledges and have different conversations and the Bond Challenge was born. And when the Bond Challenge was born, they said by 2020, they would have committed 150 million hectares of forest for restoration. What year is this? 2018. That means in two years time, we should have done that, right? Does that make sense in terms of timing? But the reality is different. The reality is that in terms of financing, most of the public financing that has been leveraged to really help restoration hasn't been enough. So UN Environment as an agency has also moved in the direction to try and leverage and get a conversation going, but also to work with private sector entities because we cannot entirely depend on, on public sector funding to actually do something that is so fundamental and necessary for um, our forest ecosystems and our just global landscapes um, per se. So today we have a really fantastic panel of experts in their own right who have had a lot of experience in terms of the work that they've been involved in in private sector uh, engagement, some working directly with actually doing, uh, providing the funding, but others indirectly with leveraging this kind of funding to do exactly uh, what I mentioned in terms of restoration for us to meet that 150 million ambition that has been um, set for us. At the very end, we have Charles Karangwa, who's coming from IUCN, the World Conservation Union. He's based in Nairobi with a regional office there, and he's done extensive work in Rwanda, in the sub-region itself, and he will give us examples in terms of how he's done this work and how they've leveraged private sector funding. Right next to him is Michael Sherlap, who's coming from um, Sale Ventures, and he's also had a lot of substantive experience over time, and they've set up new funding mechanisms, and he's also going to give us uh, some practical and, and, and concrete examples on what's worked and what hasn't worked. Right next to him is Hans Slof, who's coming from Robobank, and we've been working very closely um, with them through the UN environment, and he's the focal point for that particular uh, collaboration. And he's also going to explain to us from a bank sector what they've done, how they've moved, and the direction they want to take. Right next to him is Satya. Tripathi, who is actually our Assistant Secretary General of UN Environment and the head of the Liaison Office of UN Environment in New York. He has done amazing work at a personal and also professional level, um, originally from India. He's going to also give us a really his global perspective, but even horn down on some of the examples of the work that he's been involved in, in uh, even devising a very innovative land use finance mechanism for UN Environment. Lastly, but not the least, we've got uh, Fritjof um, Finkbeiner, who I shall not introduce based on his son, who is amazing, and we heard speak yesterday, uh, Plant for the World, but really he's also uh, a member of Rome, and he's really been involved in his own right um, in a lot of private sector funding leveraging, and we're going to hear from him as well in terms of sort of these examples. So to kick off, each member of the panel is going to do a 10-minute intervention upon which when we're going to have a conversation, and if we do have some time, maybe ask the, the general public to actually ask some questions, but for now, we'll begin with you, Charles. Over to you, please, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure my mic, so, uh, yeah, it's okay. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this panel, and uh, it gives me a privilege to speak about some of the experience uh, we have acquired over time, but also a personal feel. I'm very, my heart is really very much attached to uh, landscape restoration finance in particular, because I do strongly believe that uh, 1.5 uh, billion of degraded mm, lands can't be just restored uh, by normal or business as usual. We need to think about innovative uh, instruments uh, 
uh, to finance these restoration efforts. Uh, to start this, and I, I believe personally that we need actually to think beyond uh, deforestation free um, uh, commodity production. We need to think about a change in production patterns of different commodities, from coffee to cocoa to other type of commodities we can talk about. And uh, we need to be aware of actually the role of some of these commodities in deforestation itself. I don't know, most of you might have heard a story from Ghana on, on, on cocoa, for example, uh, coffee in my own country and tea, uh, where some, some places you just chop completely uh, original forest to plant 15,000 hectares of, of coffee or tea. So all these require a change, not just to talk about deforestation-free uh, commodities. And uh, financing obviously can take as, as, as many forms, and, and my focus will be on, on a couple of experiences we already had. Uh, number one, I believe that uh, companies uh, need to move beyond corporate social responsibilities. This has become a very nice song. Every company, you ask them uh, about environment, they say, yeah, 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 of course, we have a very good uh, CSR and we take care of planting trees. But uh, we need to look into the, the, the content of the changes in the production uh, patterns. And, and, and this, obviously, moving beyond CSR brings the landscape approach. You are really doing this work within a landscape that has people uh, in need, and, 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 and that already speaks a lot. Uh, the second uh, is, is blended finance that we keep talking about, which is a very important element, and I will talk about this as an example of the work that we have been doing, uh, and needs to consider uh, the different types of, of, of return on investments, public goods uh, versus um, a private sector return. This is very, very critical, and uh, I come from a family where my father had 15, uh, 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 50 hectares of, of coffee when I was a child, uh, and that was a lot of coffee by that time. We couldn't even manage. And uh, when I go back today, we don't have any single tree of coffee, and I'm 36 years old today. Uh, surprisingly, what happens, we have never thought about climate change that time. We didn't, we just saw coffee as a, as a good commodity and, and we could enjoy that, uh, but we didn't think about uh, uh, restoring uh, that coffee plantations, of course, it was degrading over time. As a result, no one single trees of coffee. I had to plant a forest there because there's no coffee anymore. And, and why? And I just did a pilot on the side of doing a coffee shed trees, and this is giving more production than the 15 hectares I used to have. So this is very, very important, and we need to think about this. And I've been working uh, since 2016 with a company that I won't mention the name here because the deal is under the process uh, that is interested in the uh, bamboo industrial commercial uh, plantation. And uh, the interest of the company was actually to reverse degradation. The, the government was saying, we have got 3,000 hectares. We are willing to restore that with bamboo, but we need a company that will actually give a complete value of this. And uh, we have been working with this in Rwanda for a couple of years. And, and I think next week a PPP, a private-public uh, partnership, is going to be signed where the government is bringing investment, 70 million US dollars. The private company is bringing in also money. And uh, obviously, to be able to achieve this restoration, but also uh, create a number of jobs. So this blended finance is very, very important. Um, the other example which I, I really like giving is, is, is a, a work we have been doing with tea companies that have been facing for years ha flooding of the, com the, the, their tea plantations completely and as a result losing the, the production. And, and they realized actually we need to put investments upstream uh, to manage this because the problem is flooding and we can't manage without involving smallholder farmers. The other component I would probably talk about here is actually inclusive finance. How do we talk about this without talking about smallholder farmers? Most of the land we are talking about is owned by smallholder farmers. 80% uh, of some of these commodities 
is produced by smallholder farmers. But actually, from a finance point of view, these people are out of the, 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 the discussion. I was just talking to one friend here. We really need to think about how do we bridge this gap between money holders and the smallholder farmers. Because still, they are involved in this uh, discussion. They play a big part either in deforestation or restoration. And we can't do and achieve this ambitious target without uh, involving it. So including finance, and we have been developing a number of uh, instruments. Malvede is one of the important that we just piloted. Malvede means green wealth. Uh, uh, Verde is, a, is not a Swahili, Mali is a Swahili, and the Verde is a Portuguese name, uh, which we are trying to actually uh, bring finances to smallholder farmers looking into a number of value chains. So I think we can achieve this deforestation-free commodity, but we need to look beyond just deforestation-free, but take that inclusive approach towards production patterns. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that intervention. Um, Michael, you work with Sales Ventures. So in your work, can you tell us also your experience of how you've navigated this um, sort of sector, per se? Thank you, yes. Uh, and good morning to everyone. Um, I think by now every joke about Sunday is a bit lame. But really, I'm thankful for the organizers that they um, have organized this on a Sunday because it allows me to go back on Monday and close the first transactions um, for the fund that we manage called Ant Green. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to what Ant Green is. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the experiences that we've made in the one year that we have been developing a pipeline uh, for Ant Green and kind of progressing the projects in this pipeline through the investment process um, of Ant Green. And Green is a blended finance fund. Um, so, so, you know, one of the funds that uh, you have been calling on. Um, it has 100 million uh, of investment from Norway, from the government of Norway as a public investor, and 25 million of investment from Unilever uh, as a private investor. The idea of the fund is to invest at the forest frontier where commodities are produced to delink that production uh, from deforestation. So we're investing in commercial projects. We're not investing in programs, we're not investing in landscapes, we're investing in, in, in real commercial projects of commercial operators. So we would invest in a palm oil plantation, we can invest in a soy trader. Um, rubber is a commodity that we are very keen uh, to work with. Uh, cattle uh, is, is another key commodity that drives deforestation. We can essentially invest in anything that drives deforestation. Um, and, you know, the goal of the investment is uh, to A, get the money back, and I think that's something that's really important, and I'm going to come back to that over time. Uh, but B, also get some accountable, uh, what we call environmental return, and some accountable social inclusion. So we want to see from these projects how do they actually protect forests. We want to see from these projects how do they actually include smallholders. Uh, and we want to see from these projects how do they actually improve production of these commodities. So we, we say, you know, the way we're investing is we're investing debt. Um, you know, the, the unique feature of this fund from a financial perspective is that we have a risk tolerance that is much bigger uh, than that of typical commercial capital. So we can take an exposure on a project of 15, we could even take 20 years, uh, which is not available uh, in, which is not available in the market otherwise. We can subordinate us to other lenders. Um, so that means, you know, if there's a loss on the project, um, we kind of take that loss first and then other lenders uh, come second. And the whole idea of this is, you know, we want to bring commercial investors into this space. Because, you know, 125 million is a lot of money, but it's actually nothing compared to the challenge that we have to deal with. Um, now, obviously, because we are special money, we're money that is, you know, otherwise not available, we're also asking for special things. Um, and, you know, for the environmental return and social inclusion, and the way we safeguard this is through a number of ways. I mean, first of all, we have, of course, environmental and social safeguards in place. Um, you know, we want projects to align with IFC performance standards, etc. You know, the usual things of development uh, investing. Um, we also, however, ask companies to sign an NDPE statement. So we want to be sure that if we invest in a project of a company, the company is not, you know, in another plantation, in another la country, um, continuing to contribute to deforestation. I'll come back to that, why that is a challenging requirement. 
Um, and then, you know, we also expect from companies to develop what we call a landscape protection plan. And that's essentially telling us how is the investment that we're making in the company, in the project, in a concession, how is that having an effect beyond that concession? How is that having an effect uh, beyond, the, beyond the actual direct influence of the, of, of the company? So that's a very unique, uh, that's a very unique aspect uh, of this project. So if we want to turn maybe now to you know, the pipeline and, and you know, our experiences in creating this pipeline, uh, I mean, first of all, I, I kind of want to clarify what you know, pipeline development means. Um, you know, by the time we see a project, most likely a project has already been you know, in close contact uh, with some of the NGOs we work together. We have a very close collaboration with IDH, we work with other NGOs around the planet, we work with UNEP Environment. Um, but you know, the, the sensitization of these companies to the need for action is very important for a project to even kind of come to our start of the investment process. Um, we have looked at, in this last year, at about 100 projects. I would say our active pipelines, maybe about 40 projects, rather evenly distributed across uh, Brazil, Indonesia, uh, and then you know, the, the last third kind of splits between uh, uh, the, uh, the rest of Latin America and Africa. We see a lot of projects coming from actual producers, so plantation companies, uh, cattle farms, um, and we see quite a few projects also coming from global traders. Um, there's fewer projects than we had ex expected from financial institutions, um, but that is maybe something that we can, we can tackle over time. Um, so when we, when, we look at these, when, when we look at these pipelines, um, you, you know, one of the one of the challenges we have is we need to understand who are we actually going to invest in. Mm -hmm. So one of our big, big kind of criteria that we, that we have to deal with at the very beginning of this investment process is to understand who's our counterparty. And then what is the financial standing of this counterparty? And that's often uh, a reason why projects are not included. Um, another, and now I'm coming back to this NDPE uh, requirement, is the fact that you know, many of the companies we deal with they maybe have a very interesting project in one region, but unfortunately they're not willing to sign an NDPE statement as of now, because it is, you know, for them a sunk cost uh, if they cannot develop an asset that they have somewhere else. So that's a, another kind of reason for exclusion that, uh, that we often have to do. And it's, it's, you know, one area where we then again want to work together with the NGOs that surround us with, with you know, the organizations like UNEP Environment, you know, how can we make, how can we change this? How can we bring these companies to adopt these NDPs? Um, what's important is, is aggregation. You've mentioned that, you know, it's difficult to aggregate smallholder farmers. Um, and then uh, I think, you know, an important criteria for exclusion at the very start of the investment process is the fact that if the jurisdiction in which this project is, is not approved by our jurisdictional process, we cannot invest. We need to avoid the leakage that happens if the jurisdiction is not ready and does not have proactive um, protection criteria in place. Maybe a more technical point uh, of exclusion is, 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 one of, is the one of local currency. So as a fund, we have a target of preserving our capital. That sounds like a very luxurious target to have as a fund, but it's actually quite challenging already. Now, if you want to invest in local currency, you need to hedge this local currency. And often we find that the producers that need local currency, so smaller capital farmers, smallholders, um, they, you know, combined with subsidies that are maybe in place, you know, our offer to them then becomes uh, unattractive. So, you know, the fact that we need to hedge local currency uh, is, is a big challenge for us to actually reach some of the smaller actors uh, in the space. So if we turn from the start of the pipeline to the kind of, you know, investment process through which we take the projects, you know, what are, what are the key lessons? Um, so one, uh, you know, an important lesson that we had is, you know, we were expecting as a fund to kind of, in a way, piggyback on some of the development finance institutions uh, processes. That's not happening. We see that primary agriculture in these markets is, is not something that, uh, you know, there are a lot of investors for. So in the predominant majority of the leads we're developing, you know, we are actually leading the investment process, which of course takes a lot more time than if you just kind of come in and, and, uh, 
and, and contribute uh, later. Then I think an important point is, is you know, somewhat a misconception of what blended finance is. Blended finance is not a subsidy, right? We're not giving subsidized interest rates. We're trying to create the market price for the product we have because only if we can prove that, you know, that, that the business models that we're, that we're promoting can actually pay back the money, we can attract investors in the long run. And if we can't show that, then you know, we're failing because then we're just creating an elaborate subsidy mechanism that will not really be scalable. Um, I think a big challenge uh, is often that you know, the, the, the fact that interest rates have been very stable uh, or relatively stable over time, over the last few years. So a lot of the businesses we want to finance for 15 years are looking, uh, are currently financing themselves for, with two, one year, two year, maybe five year short term loans. They're rolling them over uh, all the time. Of course, they're not investing in long term projects with that kind of financing setup, um, but they're comparing the interest rates that we need to ask for 15 year loans, even with the zero cost of capital that we have. They're comparing these interest rates with what they have for the short term loans. So another big challenge. And then, you know, finally, there's, of course, the challenge of, of, of you know, unknown, uh, unknown environmental and social requirements. A landscape protection plan, you know, that's a big, big, uh, that's a big, big question mark. You know, the work of the, work of the NGOs in, in kind of like helping companies to understand what, what a landscape is, what a landscape approach is, very valuable. But still to be accountable for something that is written in a landscape protection plan, to be accountable over 15 years for delivering environmental return and social inclusion is challenging even for those things that the companies have in their direct control. If you ask them to you know, provide a level of accountability for things that they don't have under direct control, you know, that's a very tricky negotiation um, that, that we're often involved in. Um, and I kind of want to you know, close with one last point that we see is, you know, sometimes maybe not treated uh, sufficiently, but, you know, we're dealing with big organizations. I mean, our key focus is large corporates. Uh, and in these large corporates, often you deal with someone internally who's really committed. But that person, that really committed person, when that person then needs to go to the treasury, when they need to go to legal, when they need to go to their management, they need to convince people. And, and, you know, that takes time and often kind of, you know, creates repetition. You have to explain it again and again and again. And I think it's really important that we support these internal flag bearers in a way uh, in their missions, because I know from my own experience in big corporates, it's a very tiring thing to go back over and over and over again. So I'd like to conclude with, you know, with, 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 with three things. I mean, first of all, you know, Landscape investments take time. Uh, I think you know it's 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 a little bit underappreciated on how much time they take. Um, it's a, it's it's a, it's certainly a challenge. And and two, I think we need to get better at speeding things up. Uh, we need to get better at becoming a bit more flexible on how we actually deal with all the requirements. You know, sometimes it's a little bit like you're going on a long hike. You know, the view at the end of the hike will be great, but you're still busy packing the rucksack and you haven't actually started walking. Um, and then lastly, you know, in terms of urgency, uh, I, I think I was, a, I, I was at, a, at, a, at a fantastic speech uh, lately where someone said, you know, we have 11 harvests left. 11 harvests until, you know, climate change may be a, a, a runaway danger uh, for the planet. So 11 harvests to me sounds a lot more challenging than 11 years. So we need to, you know, all get our act together and speed things up. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that, Michael. Hans, you, you've been involved in a very exciting uh, model, this Agri3 fund. Can you tell us a bit more about it and how Rabobank, um, working together with you and Environment, has kind of leveraged this process and how you got there and some of the issues and experiences from that? Please. Thank you, um, Mushanda. Happy to do so. Um, yeah, a little bit of... Um, context uh, before uh, we dive into some of the technicalities. Uh, the name Agri3 relates to the three F's, the F of forest, losing one soccer field every second, which I think uh, each of you know better than I do, but it's good to realize it again. Um, farmers, the second F, 
who need to increase food production with 70 percent uh, to keep us all fat, which means food. So by 2050, we have 9 billion uh, mouths to feed. So the sense of urgency is really there. Um, and we brought it all together in that particular triangle of forest, farmers and food, uh, which we believe um, is, is, is the core message uh, of what we need to think about, basically doing more with less, producing more food with less deforestation, less CO2 impact. So that's where the name comes from. Um, it's it's uh, a result of a partnership with UN Environment, for which we're very proud and uh, our other partners in that, uh, including FMO and IDH, IDH as a technical assistance manager. <coughs> um, what, what does this fund try to do and what makes projects eligible? I think there's quite some um, overlap also of the challenges that Michael referred to. When we look at eligibility, we try to keep it simple because the journey is uh, here and there quite complicated. So simplicity is key um, and not over engineering deals and requirements is key. It will be difficult enough down the road. So we looked at um, deforestation, obviously. So a project has to look at prevention thereof. Uh, that's key and promote forestation. Alternatively, uh, promotion of smart and sustainable agriculture, so indeed doing more with less uh, land use with and through innovation. So that's the second. The third, and that's always a must-have cumulatively, um, improvement of rural livelihoods. So that could be uh, employees of a larger farmer, but it could also be smallholders uh, taken together. So those would be your uh, three eligibility criteria before we can engage uh, through this solution. When um, we look at the operations of the fund, and you, you, you see a little bit of a complicated slide maybe in front of you, uh, let me dissect that a little bit. So you have a fund that is the AGI3 fund outside the bank, uh, which consists of a technical assistance fund that is uh, managed by IDH. And there is a finance fund of 250 million, and that's taken together 300 million. The bank, in this case Rabobank, taking the lead, will provide the commercial loan, the uh, important commercial part of a blended finance solution, because it is blended. There needs to be a commercial rationale behind it, um, and it will relate also, I'll come back to that later on, to the client base of Rabobank. But when I say Rabobank, that is because we've taken the initiative, but by design, this is open architecture. So we invite and will invite actively and engage actively with other banks. We don't want this to be a Rabobank show because also as Michael pointed out, uh, the challenge that we have is way too big than even Rabobank can handle. Um, so we will engage with other banks to create more impact. So what you see in front of you is then basically two sources of finance, if you will. One is the fund, which is the public-private partnership, and the bank or banks that together provide that blended finance solution. Where does it go? It goes to the farmer. Uh, because where the farmer sits, there's the perfect storm of the challenge, the challenge of the doing more with less. So producing more food, on the same plot of land without going into a forest and chop away trees. Uh, or when it's a larger farmer, producing more um, with innovation and therefore less pressure on the land use. So it could be a big farmer, it could be a group of aggregated smallholders, could be a combination. As long as the beneficiary is a farmer, that is key for us. We realize that with this fund, we're not the only one in this space. Um, what, what I'd like to point out, though, is that uh, the unique selling point of this fund is that it's uh, institutional cooperation with, uh, obviously, UN Environment, uh, FMO and IDH, but also the client base of Rabobank, who, as you may know, is active in food and agri 
only. So our customers sit throughout the supply chain, basically from farm to fork. Uh, that makes a supply chain solution and a supply chain finance solution easier because our clients are our execution partners, if you will, or implementation partners of this fund and have the gateway and the boots on the ground to those farmers at the farm gate, which is difficult because if you sit in a fund in London or in Utrecht or in Paris, that doesn't mean you know where to go in Africa or Brazil or Indonesia to the farmer. That takes a journey in itself and you need an operational framework around it. So that cooperation with a bank is key. And what is also key is the fact that we have local offices in those countries where you can work uh, with local teams to implement and execute those transactions because that requires local knowledge, uh, local uh, currency indeed often, but also dollar cur currency. Uh, both is something we can handle, but also the operational and credit risk management all needs to happen locally. You cannot do that from another continent. So I think that that is a little bit um, where Rabobank and the fund are complementary and can support each other. So what that really means is that uh, a consistent flow of projects from our implementation partners is going through the fund mm -hmm. because our corporate client base is losing sleep over sourcing but the necessity to do so uh, more sustainably. So that challenge we make our own and we offer with the AG3 fund a solution that makes it easier to finance those farmers and finance those projects because with the financial tools of the fund, we can de-risk parts of the loan that would otherwise not be possible. Because unfortunately so, banks do not like risk and banks can only, through the regulatory environment, take it only so far. So where a bank would stop, this is often where AG3, actually maybe also Anne Green, can come in and de-risk part of the loan that you need to uh, challenge this farmer to go on a sustainable journey. Make that investment, which will in the beginning uh, make your yield go down, which in essence often uh, makes the requirement for a longer tenor. That's where the fund comes in to help you with, this, uh, with the bridge of that longer tenor, just, to, just as a practical example. Mm -hmm. Last month, um, yeah, I think it's last month in October, World Business Council for Sustainable Development, we did a soft launch, so we're, we're a bit younger than, than Anne Green and we're, we're um, just getting going. Um, so the fund is incorporated, we're open for business. Um, what we're doing is engaging mainly with our client base and those are farmers directly, but also through our corporate clients where you go to the farm gate indirectly. And those engagements uh, look very promising. Um, I recognize some of the challenges that Michael mentions though. So it's, it, it's, it's hard work um, and it requires uh, continuous communication of the message. What I do notice though, is that the, the corporate clients are now also beyond um, talking and they're also reorganizing themselves. Sometimes you see the sustainability officer report to finance or be included in the business lines because they see that sustainability and sourcing are not two different things. They are not two different animals anymore. They are an integrated challenge. So that's how we also engage with our clients to on a more strategic level um, actually reach uh, C-level suite, CEO level, so you can have that strategic discussion separate from the silos and, and groups within, within that group. Um, so I guess that's the main message uh, of this uh, young fund, if you will. Uh, enthusiastic, started recently, open for business and uh, looking to uh, execute our uh, second deal, the first one we uh, executed already in uh, Brazil, which was a larger farmer um, looking at innovation in soil health. So we're very proud of that and that was announced in uh, Singapore. And now we're motoring on to the next in line. The pipeline is there. Thank you.
Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Satya, you've been involved in some amazing and really incredible and very innovative, and you've kind of been coined as the sort of initiator of some of the most exciting um, uh, uh, sort of ideas at, at a more pragmatic and concrete level. The example from India, can you give us a background on some of the work that you've been involved in in the India Finance Facility, for example, and also just globally what your thinking is around this uh, mechanism? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Musanda. I think uh, uh, I'll, I'll go from a little different perspective um, because uh, the, we've, we've heard, uh, you know, um, um, our former head of UNEP, often used to use this metaphor is that if uh, um, uh, if you came to people with uh, an idea that scares people, you can't scare people to action. You can excite people to action with a great narrative. You know, to take the case of uh, Martin Luther King Jr., imagine if he stood up on that fateful day and told the whole world, I have a nightmare. <laughs> how many people would he excite into action? He said, I have a dream. Um, and, and, and that's what we started with in 2015. Uh, and the dream primarily was that, and, and I'll tell you uh, where it all came from, uh, uh, with a word of gratitude to Norway uh, for putting forward a billion dollars on the table to quick start a conversation on um, a, a, a paradigm shift, uh, if I may use that term, in Indonesia on Red Plus. And that's how I ended up in that country as the executive head of uh, a 10 UN agency um, entity um, called UN ORCID, uh, the UN Office for Red Plus uh, coordination based out of Jakarta. And our job primarily was, of course, to support Indonesia in catalyzing uh, the dream that Norway and Indonesia together had when both the Prime Minister Stoltenberg and President Yudhoyono signed the MOU on 26 May 2010 uh, was that uh, they would catalyze forest conservation, protection, enhancing carbon stocks, uh, and of course biodiversity and what have you, which is um, something that you find in great measure in every part of Indonesia that you go to, one of the world's largest uh, uh, repositories of biodiversity and, uh, and of course, rainforests. The trouble was that um, uh, despite best uh, interest from both governments, uh, and I have seen this firsthand, so I'm not saying it to make either of the governments happy. I was there. I was the head of UN ORCID. I was the person uh, coordinating the entire UN system effort to support both governments to make this happen. So I've seen it on a daily basis at least 12 hours a day. On a good day, on a bad day, it could be 18 hours. Despite all the efforts, public resources don't work out the way they ought to, for whatever reasons, you know. It's, we're not going into the reasons, we're going into facts. The facts are that, eight years later, so it was signed in 2010, ideally by 2018, all the money should have been dispersed, actually. That was the initial, if you look up the MOU, it's all over the internet. It should have all been dispersed by now. Uh, that was the plan. Uh, very little money has been dispersed. Uh, one hasn't even gotten to the pay for performance phase, which was $800 million. So uh, we're still in the first 200 million part, but much of it still remains to be spent. Uh, so we were looking at all that, not out of frustration, but more from a systems perspective, as to why is it that when there is money on the table with two very willing governments, and both very honorable, nobody was uh, hoodwinking each other, because, you know, in the international uh, um, ODA or, or even targeted um, support, there's a lot of governments that position themselves into a conversation by talking billions. This was not a case like that. This was a very genuine, transparent, and uh, if you were looking for evidence, they promised a billion dollars to Brazil, and they've actually paid it much, many years ago, actually. So, so they promised a billion to Brazil, they promised a billion to Indonesia, and one part, why did it work in Brazil? Because Brazil had already done the work. They were getting paid for the work that they had already done, the achievements they already had on the table. In Indonesia, you're engineering a paradigm shift. Engineering paradigm shifts are always much more challenging than recognizing paradigm shifts that have already happened. 
So money is on the table, but it doesn't work. And here we have a room full of people that are desperately looking for resources to bring impact to where we need it the most. All of us, we are activists, that's why we are here, whether in government or in private sector or in the social sector or in civil societies, we are all here because we care about landscapes. So we were looking at the whole systems uh, from a systems perspective and we said, okay, this is not working. What else could possibly work? So our attentions got diverted to private finance and we looked at the possibilities and uh, we started building a partnership. We didn't build a fund. The, this is one model, but this is four years down the line where there are much more evidence to do. And, and, and of course, uh, uh, I would like to recognize uh, the, uh, the championship uh, of Rabobank in stepping forward and taking it to that level. There we were talking about an idea. Can we drive resources into forest conservation or bringing back forests? Um, and it has to be anchored in lives and livelihoods. Because if you don't see people as a critical part of the equation, it is not going to work. In all the countries of the world, if you look around for rules, regulations, laws, they are there in huge measure. But it never gets done because people and their needs are often victims of callous policy making. You do policy and you don't look through the lens of people. And as great a policy as you might have, people have needs, they have families, they have children who need to be looked after, health care, schools, food, everything, like we all need. And if you don't take that as your primary consideration, none of your conservation plans will work. People have to be at the heart and center of it. We call it anthropogenic climate change for a reason. People have caused it. Now you can blame a, set, a certain set of people, which is the conversation that has been going on for 46 years now, started in 1972, who pays whom? And that's why we are here today. Instead of realizing or looking for solutions like we did with the Montreal Protocol, there we started with solutions. Okay, we have a problem, but let's find the solutions. And then once you have solutions, what is it going to cost? And how will we find the resources? That's why it's such a successful convention. Uh, and, and there are lessons to be drawn from there. But coming back to our story, so we started building a partnership. We needed a fund manager. We looked around and we saw uh, ADM Capital was a very credible uh, entity that had very strong interest in um, ESG uh, and uh, was very heavily invested in Indonesia, so they understood the market and all. We talked to 13 banks, including Rabobank at the time, uh, but then, you know, we didn't have hands, so thank you. Um, you know, because champions come along as well, you know, with the rotation and there are more people in Rabobank perhaps now that are taking notice and that are willing to step out of the comfort zones. Uh, so 13 banks we spoke to, only BNP Paribas stepped forward and say, I mean, the most ambitious and uh, encouraging ones were those which said, you know, once you have one or two investments, let's talk. That doesn't mean much to me because the first investment needs somebody. So BNP Paribas stepped forward and I'm so proud that we are a partner with them. Uh, we, we started this with them, we signed a $10 billion MOU with them, their chairman, their CEO, uh, everybody is super involved in the process. Uh, they won the um, world's uh, best sustainable finance bank award from Euro Money this year. And they have, each of their portfolio managers now carries an SDG card, scorecard. If, you're plan if, if somebody comes to you for a loan or you're thinking of an investment, look at it through the SDG lens. What does it do for the world? And I think that's a fantastic thing. Uh, are they all going to do every loan in that way? I don't think so. But it's a great starting point for any uh, Europe's largest bank by assets. And so for them to think like that is a fantastic achievement by itself for them. And, and we are great, uh, it's great that uh, we have been a partner. Then of course we have, uh, um, then you need uh, somebody who will host you um, uh, and a research partner. And uh, the World Agroforestry Center, ICRAF, uh, was more than generous in hosting us, uh, in um, part resourcing us, although most of the resources have come from UN Environment uh, in uh, setting this up. And, and, and there's a lot of others that I can recognize in the room, uh, UNEP, WCMC, IDH, um, you know, a lot of other partners that we have in the room that have contributed so much 
to what it is today. And, and the first investment that we have catalyzed, um, and I use the word catalyst for a simple reason, that we like to see ourselves as not as founders or uh, doing this or that, because that's a very selfish term, I think, because uh, this credit taking is what kills partnerships. So uh, the TLFF is an equal partnership of UN Environment, ACRAF, BNP Paribas, and ADM Capital. Each one has contributed in great measure to making it what it is today. We couldn't have done with, um, without one of them. You know? So with all of them, we are much stronger. Um, and, and the first deal we have done is uh, $350 million, the partnership with Michelin. Uh, 88,000 hectares landscape, which is, by the way, bigger than the size of Singapore. Uh, no disrespect to Singapore, but just telling you that uh, it is that big, you know. Um, and 50% uh, of it is a conservation area, uh, which is being managed by WWF. Uh, the other 50% is uh, uh, the world's largest sustainable rubber plantation. Um, and uh, the first tranche of 95 million has already been catalyzed. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you, Anne Green and Sale Ventures, you know, so Anne Green is an investor in that first tranche as well. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, the second tranche we are working with the GCF is another $130 million. Uh, we were shortlisted um, of a very few handful of projects. Uh, uh, if I remember the numbers correctly, it's about seven projects were shortlisted out of 350, and we're one of them. Um, and, and that, what it does, uh, among, just to give you some small numbers, uh, it sequesters 23 million tons of CO2 equivalent, um, and it's uh, uh, thanks to USAID Development Credit Authority, we got a 50% cap capital guarantee, uh, which basically made it possible for us to raise resources at very reasonable costs, which then we can pass on to uh, the entrepreneurs, because uh, just to give you an example, uh, a project of that size, which requires 20 years gestation period, so if the difference of interest rate is between 5% and 10%, you're talking $200 million over uh, 20 years, uh, even in uh, uh, a $200 million investment, so your capital almost doubles, even if you're not compounding it in, in simple terms. So uh, that cost of capital decides actually whether your project will be successful or not, uh, and, and that's uh, sometime, and plus, how long is it for? Um, and to give you an example, oil palm in Indonesia, or anywhere else for that matter, of course now they have better breeds, but in general it takes about five years to fruit. So if you are paying 15, 20% interest over five years, before you can really earn any money, your money, your, your liabilities have doubled. And that's why it never works. And that's why smallholders who have least access to capital markets um, produce at uh, less than one-third the efficiency of the large holders. And that's the difference, the la access to technology, equipments, and, uh, and most importantly, finances. Mm -hmm. So this particular project, apart from saving a lot of species and becoming a buffer around a 300,000 hectare uh, forest landscape, which is still living and breathing, also gets direct and indirect employment to 50,000 people. Um, and uh, in terms of productivity, it produces at almost twice the rate of uh, the current average rate of productivity, which is 0.8 tons per hectare in Indonesia rubber. And uh, this project targets 1.7 tons per hectare. So it brings the best of technology, best of resources, and best of ideas. And, and the government loves it because um, this is a great partnership. We couldn't have done it without the government. Uh, every time we look up to them, Ibu Siti was here uh, yesterday and uh, uh, and, and she has been a pillar of support to this, as are <coughs> several ministers, Pa Luhut and Pa Sofian Jalil, uh, Pa Darmin, their coordinating minister for economic affairs, Ibu Sri Mulyani, the finance minister. They've all been super supportive. The government doesn't have to put a penny, but the government has to be there with you every step of the way, because the policy risk is the biggest risk uh, in, in this whole arrangement. And if the government is with you, you don't have a policy risk. They'll stand with you at every point of time. Uh, moving to India, we started uh, the Sustainable India for the Finance Facility there uh, last year. Uh, the first investment we have catalyzed is $2.3 billion uh, that we'll be raising from the capital markets and channelizing into uh, something called the Zero Budget Natural Farming Project, 
which is we have contributed precious little to it. It's all their work, uh, but we are glad to be associated with it and help them in our own small way. Uh, Yoast is here in the room. Uh, IDH has signed an MOU with them uh, to start helping them access the global markets for cotton, chili, and other things. So it's these kind of partnerships that actually make the farmers believe in themselves. When they are doing a system scale transformation, every partner that can get on board uh, and, uh, and support um, will work phenomenally well. Now, why is that project so significant for the world? Uh, it's a province of 55 million people, uh, Andhra Pradesh. What they are doing is, uh, a system scale transformation. This is not a project. This is, this is not even a program. This is system scale transformation. They're converting six million farmers to zero chemical farming. Um, and imagine this will make available in mass market terms food produced in a natural way with, without using any synthetic chemicals whatsoever. And they have already converted half a million farmers as of today. Uh, and by next year, they'll get to a million. Uh, by 2021, uh, 2.1 million. By 2023, um, uh, 6 million. So that's, and it grows uh, exponentially because they do a farmer to farmer extension. The more you do, the more champion farmers you have. And then they come together to train their fellow farmers. That's why this works. And uh, the cost, the input cost goes down by roughly 80% uh, because you don't have to buy chemical fertilizers anymore. Uh, and you use substances which are normally available locally, cow dung, cow urine, and 200 different uh, botanical uh, and uh, biosubstances. And uh, the yield, depending on the crop, uh, has gone up anywhere between 8 to 28%. Uh, in terms of soil health, there are exponential improvements in soil health in uh, areas that have been doing this. In some places, they have already gone up to seven, eight crop cycles because they started in 2015. Um, and, uh, and it is, uh, they recently won, uh, I'm so proud of them, that uh, they recently at the Paris Peace Forum, where more than 800 projects were submitted worldwide, they, they received the award for the boldest agricultural vision uh, by UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres was there, and as well as, and this was organized under the patronage of President Macron. Uh, in Paris just uh, two weeks ago. And so, so it is catching on. And, and the beauty of it is that uh, Pasofian Jalil, who's the Honorable Minister of Land Affairs of Indonesia, he was there recently with a big delegation. Um, and he spent uh, several days uh, meeting with the Chief Minister and the ministers and uh, more importantly, spending days on the far farmer's fields. And now we are discussing, and I was discussing with Ibu Siti as well yesterday, how can we transplant the idea, uh, pin down uh, the science in terms of, because when you are replicating what works in uh, one geography may not necessarily, while the parameters in terms of project parameters or implementation parameters might be same, uh, but this is science as well in terms of, it's a microbial count uh, in the substances, the inputs that you use, um, and because they are, this is, this is soil science at its best. Um, so pin down the, uh, the metrics so that we see what is available locally within Indonesia, why does it work here, and how could it work in other geographies um, as well as in Africa or Latin America and elsewhere. So that's what it is, and this is, that's an investment of $2.3 billion. There are two other projects we are working on which could total up to about $30 billion um, in investments. Great. So at the end of it, um, mm -hmm. If you have an idea, if you have a dream, um, find the right partners to work with. Right. Um, and, uh, and UN Environment, and I'm not uh, uh, pitching UN Environment here, because now <laughs> that I'm formally a part of UN Environment, but, uh, but UN Environment uh, has some of the greatest entrepreneurs within the UN system that really think differently. And, and, uh, Great. And so talk to us. We'll be very happy to partner with you. Great. Thank, Thank you, you Satya. <laughs> Thank you so much. Frithjof, as a member of Club of Rome, can you give us your, your experience um, and having sort of listened to, to the different uh, members here on the panel, what your experience has been in this field? Thank you very much that we speak about big numbers because we, the numbers will be bigger. We, we will add some more dark red stripes the next years, and I would like to 
combine development and climate in the next some minutes. Uh, we know that we are heading towards a cliff in a very fast way, and I think we probably will jump over it, but we still have a chance to stop. There's a chance to stop, but we have to do it, and we have about 10 years ahead of us where we really can make a difference. And let's look on the two-degree goal, let's look on Paris. The black line is the Paris Agreement. We all learned that two degrees, even 1.5 degrees, but we also learned in the meantime that we will go to 3.6 to 4 degrees by Paris Agreement. Uh, if we all will stick to the Paris Agreement, what is not a, an agreement? Yeah? You can step out of the agreement, so it's not an agreement. But maybe one steps out because there's an agreement that the rich part of the world agreed that we will finance the poor part of the world by 100 billions a year starting from 2020. So we have to invest and implement 100 billion every year. And this is a big challenge ahead of us. And if you imagine, just take the last 10 years of China. China made a wonderful progress in sustainable development goals and many of these goals. Poverty was reduced and wonderful, but the SDG number 13 was a catastrophe. China was doubling the emissions per capita. China is, in the meantime, exhausting more per capita than Europe. Germany is worse than uh, China. But uh, China was, in the last five years, producing as much concrete and steel as the United States in the whole history. So, and if we then copy this progress to Africa, to India, and to Latin America, we don't have to speak about climate anymore. So we have to use the next 10 years and the future will be decided in Africa. Because in Africa, we will double the population in the next 30 years, from 1.2 to 2.4, and we will double another time until 2100, end of the century, to 4.4 people, billion people. So this is the challenge ahead of us. And if we take development and climate together and we want to reach this two-degree goal, yeah, we have to reduce additional 500 billion tons of carbon dioxide additional to Paris. And this is possible, and it will, lost, it will cost a lot of money, but it is possible. And there's no problem of money on this planet. There's no problem of money on this planet, and it's about humanity, it's about humankind, it's about survival. And the question is, how can we mobilize an awfully big amount of money? And we think about it probably additional to the 100 billion, we need another 500 billion every year to close this ambition gap between four and two degrees. 500 billion for the next 30 years, it's 15 trillion. I mean, I, I think um, BlackRock, they have 6.4 trillion. So the money is here. We just have to get the money from the private sector. I don't think we can push the governments more and more, but I don't think they will, or I think they will even struggle with 100 billion they promised to Paris. And now we need another 500 billion. So the only chance is to, to get this money from the rich part of the world. And I don't speak about the rich countries of the world. I also speak about the rich people in India and in Africa that are living. So we have to get the money from the 1% of the rich of the world. We have more than 2.5 thousand billionaires, and every, every year they are 10% adding to it. They have the money. So how can we mobilize the money from these people as new actors in climate and development policy? This is the task we have ahead of us. And we need a positive chain reaction, as I said. Not a nightmare, but a dream. We have a dream. It's possible. It is possible. It's, we are not five minutes to 12. It's much later. But it's still positive. We have just to believe it. Yes, we can. We can do it. And this is the idea of starting a ch positive chain reaction on a global scale to mobilize this money. And the, we have a lot of ideas. We have a lot of many pledges, but there's no Im implementation strategy. And we need a call to action, a very strong call to action to everybody. And we have a plan. And this plan is interlinked very much to global and landscape for uh, um, afforestation because to close this ambition gap, half of this ambition gap we can close by landscape and forest restoration.
half of it is possible, and the rest we just have to think about the geopolitical advantage of Africa. Africa has deserts, it's wonderful. In the desert there's so much energy, so much sun, we just have to take this sun. We have, energy is an unlimited resource. We just have to take this sun and make Africa r rich in a clean way, and we can transport this energy to make the European and the rest of the world, the rich part of the world, clean. We can use this either by making pipelines of, of, of electricity lines, a gigawatt line is big like that, to transport the electricity, or we can make power to gas or power to liquid. Get out the carbon dioxide by, and make methanol, synthetic uh, fuel for kerosene, because we will fly in the next years and continue to fly. So there's a chance using this electricity, this power to gas, the power to liquid. And we can create an unlimited export resource for the African people without any negative side effects. They can export like hell clean energy to the rest of the world and getting a lot of money we just have to help them, support them to make these uh, PV and or these mirrors to create this. The plan, let's go to the plan, how to mobilize the people to plant trees. Yeah? To plant trees is a half of the, of the ambition gap to, towards the two degrees and the desert tech idea with the sun of the, of the deserts is the second part to go to, towards the two degree. We have one goal and we have four tools. We offer a toolkit to everybody to use this toolkit. And the toolkit, um, the toolkit is very easy. We have to have a very strong publicity campaign to everybody. That's on the right hand side. We have to have um, prominent people to be the ones to be the promoters of this idea. We have to get the money from the companies by climate neutrality and we have a platform. You heard about this platform yesterday already, the platform where you can find all these wonderful restoration projects and as a guy, as a rich guy, I could invest yeah, to get a return of investment. I, I can make donations to these projects. Yeah? And we have, to, we have to give up the idea that there's a bad money out of the planet. There might be people who didn't get the money in a correct way and all the money is, is combined with carbon dioxide, so we can say this is bad money, but I think we have to convert this bad money in good trees and good restoration. This is very important. And um, the campaign, you saw this picture, I think one of them already yesterday, so it should be a good campaign. Our climate will, uh, will be cured not in Paris, but in the forests. Some positive ideas, some positive stories about mobilizing. Yeah? Imagine 20 or 100 of these stories in all over the world to mobilize the people. Yes, there is a chance. It's cool. Yeah? I will be part of it. I want to be part of it. And think about a lot of ambassadors. We have 300 very prominent. You have a lot of ambassadors. Let's make this message. Let's start planting trees. Let's start restoring uh, uh, restoration and do it. Yeah? Just to mobilize the people. We have to get the heart of the people. We have to get the heart of the rich people. And the rich people think the same way as you think. Yeah? They are not different. They just have a bigger bank account. And they know that with this bank account, they cannot do anything. If you make this as a heritage for your children, you spoil them. So that's, that's all what they know. So they have to do something intelligent with it. And the rich people of the world, they know that if we don't solve the climate problem, they will not be rich anymore in the future because they will lose all their property titles. Yeah, there will be uh, right-wing development in many countries. They will not sell any more products in this amount what they sell today. So we have to tell them your chance is that you become a hero and you save your business. That's the story what we have to tell them. And there's my last point. We have to tell them, we have to sell them something. And, this, and we, what we can sell to these companies is climate neutrality. Yeah, you exhaust carbon dioxide and for the amount you exhaust, you plant trees or you make protection of forests. And please, we have to give up the greenwashing subject. Many companies would plant a lot of trees, but they are, are afraid that the NGOs, that I'm also representing NGOs, but that the NGOs will come and say, yeah, you're a bad company because you exhaust so much carbon dioxide. We have to give up this uh, offensive that is about greenwashing. We need the money of the company, so it's not very wise to tell them you are greenwashing. So let's make them, the company's heroes, by 
planting trees by restoring a landscape, also investing in geopolitical uh, uh, solar energy power plants in the desert, yeah, to make Africa rich in a clean way and to make the rest of the world uh, also the rich part of the world clean. And that's, that's the chance what we have. The platform finds the thing and it's positive and it's possible to start a chain reaction on a global scale. We just have to believe it and we have to tell this dream to everybody and we have to collect 500 billion euros every year by transparency and by good stories. It is possible, but we just have to use the time now. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for your play of words. Believe it. <laughs> I really like that. Um, I think in listening to, to the panelists, we've got 10 minutes to have a conversation now. Um, I'll just summarize fairly quickly. It's been very interesting to sort of start from the site in terms of you know, what's happening to farmers, the issues of um, small-scale farmers, and, and linkages to this financing and what the challenges um, are. And we listened um, to Michael in terms of how he also wrapped it up in terms of the large-scale investment that they're making as sales venture, Brazil, Peru, different parts of Africa, et cetera, in big plantations, smaller. Um, and it was really also interesting to understand this triangulation um, from Hans in terms of food forests and farmers how do we actually navigate? I think this also brings us all together in this conversation and the financing, dynamic private sector financing. In listening to Satya, I think one thing that we got home really was this issue of the nightmare. Do we need to be selling this? Now, we shouldn't be, but we should be selling this dream, this ambition, but also the power of catalytic relationships and the power of catalytic roles to really navigate this landscape. And in closing um, up on your point, I think you bring this global context. And uh, it's interesting that you say money isn't the problem and money is not the, the challenge here. And as such, really, how do we how do we get philanthropy to actually provide funding in, in this really important? And I think in my thinking, I feel that climate change is an equalizer in many ways, whether you're rich, we're poor or whatever. It has equalized us all and has made us vulnerable as humanity. I would like to just ask the panel members, it really in less than a minute, your thinking in terms of the ambition. Do we think this is a new normal? Do we think this is really a paradigm shift, in your opinion, the whole private financing, starting with you? Uh, Charles. I think this is a paradigm shift, definitely. And uh, as you mentioned, climate change is an equalizer. We are equal, uh, and, and one is above another one. Um, rich and poor, uh, tall and short, uh, we need to think uh, together how do we address this. And a couple of things. One, we have ambitions. It's very good. We have 350 million. We have achieved 168 million of commitments. Uh, that's a good ambition. But we need actually to create now a movement, a movement from a smallholder farmers who are involved in the land use and land change issues and who are also at the same time uh, suffering from the climate change. And we need a movement from governments and policy makers and, and, and very uh, influential leaders. We need a movement from private sector and, and big investors. Mm -hmm. We need to create that movement. It's not just for one, two, three, four companies to change this. And finally, we need trusts and partnerships to make this happen. I do strongly believe that uh, with this, we, we can actually achieve these uh, great ambitions we have together. And, and we are seeing already a lot of initiatives. And recently, IUCN just set up something called CPIC. It's a coalition of private investors in conservation, which is bringing this discussion together in forest, in coastal resilience, in fisheries. How do we invest responsibly and sustainably? Thank you. Michael. Is yes. it a new normal? I think, I think there is a paradigm shift happening in the heads of individuals. I think where we need to see the paradigm shift arrive is at the level of organizations. Because I think, you know, we've seen a lot of examples of, of things that are happening. But I think, you know, there's inertia in, in many organizations in, in, in changing. A uh, um, nice example from our, from our pipeline work is, is, is you know, that we we're, we're talking to a, a, a large, uh, a large organisation about a loan that would 
you know, protect significant amount of forest. But the problem is, you know, in their lending templates that they're using for much bigger normal corporate lending, you know, it doesn't really fit in there. And it's a challenge to overcome these lending templates. So there's, there's just an organizational inertia that needs to be overcome. Mm -hmm. So I think the next challenge is, is at the level of organizations and how do you actually translate the shift, the paradigm shift in the heads of people, which mm -hmm. I agree is, is happening. How do you translate that at the level of an organization? How do you avoid the organization being the roadblock to individuals actually making the change? Great, thank you. Hans. Yes, thank you. Um, I do see a paradigm shift. Um, yes, it needs to be quicker, but uh, five years ago, Rebel Bank would never have done what they are doing now. Um, I think it's, 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 it's gutsy. Um, from a banking perspective, it's risky. Um, will it make money? Probably not. So you see leadership within companies, uh, even in sticky, uh, slow banks like Rabobank, because they're not famous for, for their speed. You see things picking up quickly. Uh, setting up a fund for these type of investments is, is quite uncommon. Uh, so uh, we see leadership step up. Uh, we see cooperation much more happening, I think, between us in the pa panel as well and with you in the audience, but also uh, amongst competitors. <clears throat> we talk, as Satya mentioned, um, to BNP, and we find out that the way they bank and finance impact is complementary to ours, which you would not find out if you don't talk. Mm -hmm. um, and I was in Singapore talking to one of the uh, strategists of BNP about the LFF, actually. Um, and understanding how it works. And actually, it's exactly complementary to what we do. So we build uh, the loans and the investment base in Indonesia, and they can securitize it. So if you also open your minds and you, you, you talk about it and think less about competition and, ooh, uh, we want to be first and the best, it's, it's too much to, to deal on your own. You need to be humble and, and reach out and cooperate. And to wrap that up, I do see that leadership, I do see that cooperation happening. It needs to be quicker, I agree, but things are very different than one or two years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Satya. Well, you know, the, uh, somebody was telling me, it's a little disrespectful, but it was truthful, so I'll share that with you. And I was in a conference, and uh, the, the gentleman stood up, and he said, uh, he looked at the audience, and he said, uh, do you, which biological species uh, do you resemble, you know? Um, and, uh, and of course, um, uh, um, you know, the people had a lot of ideas, you know, somebody came up with orangutan and the primates and all. And, uh, and he said, no, you resemble the frog. Why? Because you don't get it. Like the frog, the temperature is rising and you think you're going to adapt and everything <laughs> around you will be fine and then you don't have the strength anymore to jump out or make the difference, and you all die. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, um, uh, and why I remember that in the context is that we somehow believe that uh, everybody else is going to be affected and we will not be affected. I, I mean, it's strange because, um, and I was telling this to a room full of bankers the other day, is that everything they do is about risk. It's about managing risk, all financial, models, tools, uh, everything is about managing risks. How is it that I'm going to protect my investment? And of course, if I can make some money on top of it, it's fantastic. If it's 15, 20%, it's awesome. But even two or three or 5% is great. You know, that's, that's how the whole financial thing is modeled. And how do you not see the risk for what it is? Mm -hmm. This is existential risk to the entire planet in 10 years time. You know, what part of we are headed to a 6% even if the Paris Agreement is implemented in full force, we'll be still at 4%, and we are now firmly headed to 3.2%, as the emissions gap report points out uh, so eloquently, and that uh, there is no hope unless we really turn the corner pretty quickly. Uh, and that's the, the message of hope is that we really have to change behavior uh, very rapidly. So is it a new normal? The answer is no. Uh, can it become the new normal? The answer is an emphatic yes. Because if you see currently everything we do is transactional, whether it's a bank, whether it's organizations. You know, I was uh, uh, with a, in a meeting with Tony Simons and Robert, you were there. Um, 
And Tony put it very nicely. He said, you know, uh, about, we're talking about the GLF uh, and the future and how to enhance and all. And he said, I am here to build partnerships. I am here to find out what you are doing. And, uh, and I'm, I'm here to collaborate in the best possible manner. But I'm not here to share what I am doing uh, because you might steal my ideas. I don't want to uh, tell you who my donors are because you might go and approach the same donors. And he said this 50% approach to any partnership never works. So if I want others to open themselves to me, I have to be equally willing to open myself to others. Mm -hmm. And this is the message of the TLFF or this SIFF or anything else that we are trying to do in the realm of private finance. It has worked because we have opened ourselves completely and transparently, unreservedly to the, our partners. Right. Uh, and we don't pretend to lord over them. We, we, we tell everybody that we are partners and that's it. We are all equals. We never uh, try to steal anybody's thunder because there's enough thunder for everybody to be <laughs> dazzling with. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank sir. you very much. Great. It was a wonderful last word, so, but I will miss them up a little bit. <laughs> yes, we need a paradigm shift. We have 10 years ahead of us. The next decade counts. And the paradigm shift is that we have to mobilize the private sector to finance development and climate. This is the paradigm shift, and we have to make them heroes. That we have to understand they're the only ones Made, it might be unfair, but they're the only ones who can finance this development. And we have to create the next 30 years, 20 million jobs every year in Africa. 20 million additional jobs for the next 30 years, 600 million jobs. And uh, landscape and forest restoration is a wonderful possibility to combine jobs and to combine wealth and to combine income. And if we create electricity in the in in Africa and many everywhere. And if we bring TV, then we also will solve the population problem because TV is very helpful for that. And, and we have to make the companies heroes. That's, that's whether we like it or not. And no matter whether it's uh, if you're philanthropic or whether the companies want to have a return of investment, we shouldn't make any difference about that. We just have to go for it and make the companies become climate neutral, make them, make the youth may tell them we will work with you or if you don't do it, we will not work with you, just do it. That's a chance and that's a paradigm shift we have to tell the companies. Okay, thank you so much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, we come to an end of this session, and I just really want to thank the um, panel members for their really insightful and really exciting conversations in this very complex topic, quite frankly, and also really understanding and how we can navigate the whole private sector entity. It's really, it's really interesting, and, and just in closing, I'd say um, when climate deniers tell us that, you know, it's not happening, clearly, which part of it's getting hot in here did you not understand? So I think it's really interesting to really get your insight, your leadership, and your guidance in terms of how we navigate this um, particularly very interesting and important area. I want to request that the members of the public, if you can actually just give them a hand again. And then a hand to you as well for coming to this side event.